Thanks, guys. <laughs> so uh, thank you for introducing me. I am Sean Kelly. I'm an EAI architect at Proximus in Belgium. I'm a member of the middleware team who are responsible for API management, also B2B, gateway, B2B integrations, and application-to-application -application integrations, essentially EAI, enterprise application integration, irrespective of whether those applications are deployed on-prem or on the cloud. Today, I'm going to speak to you about how WSO2 helps Proximus realize our IT transformation ambitions. However, before I get into that, I'll just give you a quick overview of the presentation today. I'll introduce Proximus that I work for. I will touch upon EAI that, you know, oftentimes pe people say we want to simplify. However, simplification does not automatically mean that it's going to be a simple and easy uh, road. From that, we will look at the IT transformation journey that we're taking at Proximus and how API management is a core component of that journey. And then we'll look at the architectural approach that we took and some of the key principles that we derived from that. Then we'll take a look at how WSO2 underpins the strategy and how we technically enable that direction using WSO2. And hopefully, if I have some time, I think I will have some time, we will take a look at some of the APIs that we expose uh, at Proximus. OK, so who are Proximus? We are the uh, leading Belgian provider of internet, telephone, television, and network-based ICT services. We are the largest telco in Belgium. We are headquartered in Brussels. We were founded in 1930, have around somewhere around 14,000 employees with an annual turnover of around, I think, 6 billion euros per annum. Uh, there are quite a few brands under our umbrella. You can see here Scarlet, for example, is our no frills brand. It's like the Ryanair of telco, if you will. Uh, Tango is a challenger in the Luxembourg market. Uh, da Vinci Labs is another brand of ours. They provide uh, enterprise security services. Uh, Bix is also under our umbrella. They are a top global voice carrier with a presence in Africa, Asia Pacific, the Americas, Europe, and the Middle East. These are our HQ in Brussels. If you want to uh, find me later on, you can see that's my desk right there in the, in the towers in Brussels. Fun fact before we begin, the telegram, which has been around for more than 150 years, okay, irrespective of all the innovation and IT transformations that's going on, it's been around for more than 150 years. It's only last year that Proximus actually retired the telegram in Belgium. It really shows you that even though we're, we're very much looking towards the future, there's still quite a lot of technology and uh, uh, capabilities that will still continue to last, irrespective of our efforts. OK, so let's take a look at our IT transformation journey and how API management is very much a component of that. I think I'm standing in the way. I'll just move to the side. OK, so. I mentioned earlier that um, I'm a member of the middleware team where we're very much focused on enterprise application integration. And it's not always easy to, to integrate for technical reasons, but also for reasons of organization and uh, uh, process as well. So if you consider within our organization, we have more than, we have between two and 3,000 applications, and we have to manage the integrations between those applications that either provide services or consume services. And you can imagine that if you don't manage those integrations, this is not showing correctly, but okay. Um, yeah, I think the PowerPoint was not, uh, was not formatted correctly. It's not showing correctly. If I go back, you see the... OK, never mind. What I'm trying to say is that because integration is not so easy, uh, one of the solutions that people often apply is they try to uh, rationalize the application landscape by grouping applications with common functionalities together. 
Uh, for example, here I had the text sales up here, I had ordering down there, I had repair down here, and I had billing. And the integrations, oh wow, this is actually working. <laughs> um, it's quite complex, and by grouping applications together functionally, you, you don't solve the underlying EAI question. You just add a new dimension to the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, this problem is already difficult enough, irrespective of whether you're integrating applications hosted internally on your, on your uh, corporate network or externally. So you could imagine having to integrate not just internal applications, but integrating with partners, competitors, corporate customers. And we do have to do that because the, the, um, the Belgian telecom regulator mandates that we have to integrate with our competitors for reasons of uh, competition and uh, fairness. So if you don't manage these interactions, you really end up with a spaghetti on your hands. You have a very difficult time anytime you want to make a change um, uh, doing impact analysis, and making sure that you have high availability uh, as a result. So let's take a look here at the solution that we came up with more than 10 years ago. We put a middleware in place, and this is where we manage the commodity services, such as authentication, authorization, routing, and monitoring. And we've been doing this for quite some time for our SOA services. It's worked quite well for us. And it allows us to implement such things as kill switches. If, for example, you had a runaway process that's, that's going wild, you can, using our middleware, switch that interaction on and off. So that's worked quite well. However, IT transformation happened. What happened there? Well, basically, business came to the architects and they said, listen, guys, we need to be more agile. We need to deliver better quality. We have to do it faster and we have to do it at a lower cost. Hmm, interesting challenge. So what did we do? We took a look at the challenge and we came up with the following core idea. We said that we would stop thinking in terms of systems, like SAP, for example, and instead we would start looking at building reusable, functionally shaped building blocks that are loosely coupled and not overlapping, okay? And from that, we can build digital solutions, with the end result being that we should be able to deliver higher quality and agility at a lower cost. So to do that, we figured, let's take an API-first approach. APIs are something that, if you, if you want to offer functionality to other teams, other companies, or to customers, or to other components, APIs offer you the flexibility of integrating with that functionality, irrespective of whether they are um, web GUIs, fat clients, or components that are commercial off-the-shelf products. So to take this API-first approach, well, we looked at what we already had. We were already doing some quasi-form of API management. However, they were in the form of SOA services, and we saw that in the previous slides where we have the middleware in place with we had our governance, we have our internal domain models, but we had to rethink what we were doing, and essentially, we have to look at making APIs great again, okay? To do that, we had to take a lot of our architectural domains that were well-defined and separate and bring them together. So we have the functional domain where we define our internal domain model. We have subject matter experts that operate on specific blocks of data or blocks of functionality, such as, let's say, customer address management. Uh, we have the security domain, who are responsible for such things as GDPR compliance. That's an important one. Uh, the application domain will be the application team that finally builds the business logic that's being offered. They are responsible for that logic, for the application that's being deployed, the patching, the upgrading, the migration, etc. And then the infrastructure domain is, is also a team that are very important for, you know, you're going to deploy a piece of logic, but where are you going to deploy it? Are you going to deploy it internally in-house, on the web, on a cloud platform? How are you going to move it there? How are you going to do the routing? What kind of firewalls are in place, etc.? That's where the infrastructure team come in. So we brought these domains together. However, okay, move forward. Let's take a look at the functional domain. 
So what we've done in our organization for IT transformation is we have looked at our, all of our business capabilities. What is it that we do internally that enables us to perform our day-to-day -day function? We documented those capabilities and we, we had some properties that, we, that we, we assigned to the notion of business capability. So what exactly does that look like? Okay, so a capability must be a subject matter expert. A capability such as customer address management is the owner and master of that specific block of data. By doing that, it means that you have one source of truth. And if you want, as another component, to interact with customer address management, you know where to go. There is one place to go. There is one team responsible for that. And it also means that you don't have to choose between 10 or 12 different places that potentially manage the same data and have to synchronize amongst each other. Right? So you solve a lot of problems by doing that. As a result, we also foresee that these business capabilities are mutually exclusive, as I was saying. They are unique. They are uh, also independent, which means that they can not only be the source of truth, but they can operate on their own. So irrespective of the environment changing around those capabilities, they can still operate uh, independently. They are self-contained and well-defined. So if you, um, if you use terminology for customer address management, the same kind of terminology will be used in another capability. So they're, they're understandable. And they're abstract, meaning that if you have an organization that's divided up into multiple business units and you expose your capability in one business unit, it is actually usable across the entire enterprise. Okay. So we took a structured approach. First of all, we took a look at simplification. Our SOA services that we've been working with for the last 10 or 15 years have quite a heavy governance process. However, for APIs, we decided to go with a more lightweight approach. Lightweight, but powerful, especially when it comes to their life cycles and the, the release processes associated with that. We also empower the, the, uh, the product teams with more control. And we introduce more, ability, more agility through uh, self-service of our API management platform. So even though we introduce self-service now that wasn't there before, we still have to assure that we have powerful processes there, but processes that make sense, because we don't want to suddenly open up all the functionality of API management, because then you'll end up with the Wild West. You could imagine that if different um, naming conventions were used on different APIs, then you have inconsistencies. The same thing with versioning, access control, etc. So even though it's a self-service platform, we do have uh, certain controls in place. Collaboration is um, quite interesting because, you know, as we saw on a previous slide, we have a lot of different architectural domains that have to collaborate and work together. And um, in any organization, that, of course, can be a challenge and sometimes mean that a mindset change is also needed to achieve that. Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot of change that we have to deal with as a result of this. API management is very different to what we do traditionally with SOA services. We're moving from SOA to ROA, so from service orientation towards resource-based architecture. And uh, uh, to do that, we looked at a strategy called bimodal. This is a term coined by Gartner, and I think it was mentioned in Massimo's meeting yesterday. Bimodal is a strategy for coping with change. So what is it? It's, it's a strategy that's composed of two modes, mode one and mode two. So this is what they say. Gartner say that mode one and mode two are not separate groups of people. Okay? They're not separate departments and they're not separate subdivisions within a company. They are cycles. Interesting. But what does that concretely look like? Well, let's take a look here at mode one. Mode one is more so the marathon runners. These are your APIs or your business capabilities that are long living. They don't change so often. They are not allergic to change, but these typically represent your core business functions. You could imagine an ordering process. 
That's something that doesn't change so often. The products used in the ordering process might change, but the ordering process itself wouldn't change so often. Compare that now to mode two. Mode two are more like the, the sprinters. These are your APIs that respond to the environment. They're closer to your customers. They're more agile, okay? And they're typically more disruptive. Now, this mode one and mode two is, I, I agree, it's, it's very binary. In our organization, it's, it's not as clear-cut black and white as that. It's more fluid, but this represents, I think, the, the two modes in, in a good way. So, mode one, we typically apply that to our internal APIs and existing SOA services, where we have less frequent changes, okay? We have more stricter governance, and we use an internal domain model. However, for mode two, we apply those to our external APIs. So for example, the APIs that we expose to our external customers where we want to have agility and where we adapt to a changing environment. This is where we publish our digital products. So our capabilities are exposed and published as digital products. And of course, we have a strong focus on security there because we're exposing outside our boundaries of our network. Let's take a look at some of the key principles that uh, we have derived from our IT transformation ambitions. First one here is no domain model dumping. This is a term coined also by Gartner, where you know, we, we use and we utilize concepts known within the organization that are well known within the organization. However, it doesn't make sense to expose those externally, especially if you consider that you want to expose capabilities and APIs that are easy to understand um, by anybody, okay? So we don't do domain model dumping. We also design for loose coupling. That's an important one because we favor vendor-neutral APIs over vendor-specific APIs. It allows us to swap out one component for another quite easily with minimal impact. Okay. We utilize industry standards such as OAuth2, uh, Zacamel, SID, uh, JWT, etc. I mentioned REST here, but REST is more of an okay, it's back. REST is more of an architectural style than anything else, so maybe it's not really applicable. But we do use REST. And you've heard also in some of the other. Um, some of the other presentations that the use of smart endpoints and dumb pipes is something that a lot of organizations are looking at today. By pure hazard and by pure chance, that's something that we've always done in our middleware. We have always shied away from putting business logic in our middleware because we feel that it's the role and responsibility of the back-end team that's exposing the capabilities that needs to manage the business logic. Okay. It means that they can patch, they can add new features, they can change their logic without having a dependency upon the middleware team. And conversely as well, it means that the middleware team can patch, migrate, update, and change the middleware without risking impact on your business logic. Right? So that's that one. The next one, uh, another principle, is that security should be configured and not coded. You could imagine if you have 10 different services, each exposing their capabilities but utilizing the same security principles, that if you have to code that same security mechanism 10 times, you'll have 10 different pieces of code and potentially different problem. I, I can hear something. And potentially, um, a, as a result, you, you have higher risk. Now, if you configure security instead, it means that typically the code is written once, it's validated by security, it's, it's going to give you a greater sense of security as a result because you simply configure it and it's much easier to manage. It means that your people who are building the logic can focus on delivering value than, fo than focusing on actually building security mechanisms and understanding the security in detail. So security should be configured, not coded. Uh, the second last one on the slide is that we typically trail behind the bleeding edge somewhat. We, we don't want to use the latest and greatest version of a particular piece of software because we want to allow the dust to settle, the first round of patches to come out, and then we can look at 
using this functionality in production with greater confidence as a result. And the last one is, is very important to us, that if we either build a component or we purchase a piece of software, that it must be cloud native. We want to have the ability to deploy that software either internally on our internal network or on the cloud, or move it from our internal network to the cloud, or move it from one cloud to another. Okay? So for us, if you're a provider of software and you're not cloud native, we won't be your customer. It's as, it's as clear cut as that. So the result of all this thinking is that an IT architecture was born, a target architecture, where you can see that API management is a core component there. At the bottom here, you can see that we have our business capabilities and our telco services that I was mentioning earlier. Traditionally, this was more your mode one in our bimodal approach. However, more recently now, we're also applying the mode two uh, to these APIs as well. From these core capabilities, we now build digital products and we expose them on our external API marketplace for our customers to use. You can see here that we have more than one cluster of API management in play. We do a clear separation between APIs that are used internally versus APIs used externally. Of course, the thinking here is that if you have an issue with DDoS attacks, etc., you have a clear separation between that and your internal day-to-day -day workings. That gives you your extra confidence so that you can continue working um, internally and performing your your day-to-day -day duties uh, without intervention. Let's take a look at API management now for a second. So you saw it was a key component in the middle of our API management solution. Here we have the sorry, I should point here. Here you have the publisher component, the App Store, and your API gateway runtime. Okay, so to do that, of course, we use the WSO2 API manager. That component is not the only one that we use. For analytics, we use the data analytics server. And then to reach out to our identity provider and other identity providers, we use the WSO2 identity server for that. The API gateway also uses the, uh, the key manager service to reach the identity server. However, these are only three of the many components that WSO2 offer in their, their suite. So the game hasn't stopped here. We are still looking at using other components of WSO2. The governance registry looks like an interesting one that we potentially could use for our existing SOA services and our mode one APIs. So it looks like it might be a good fit for that. Second candidate is the micro gateway. We had some discussions earlier today with the guys from WSO2 about the micro gateway, because maybe that could be something that will be interesting to use instead of the API gateway component. Okay? So that one's also under consideration. And the final one is the cloud services gateway, because we deploy capabilities not just from within our own network, but we also deploy them from the cloud. And from the cloud, they need to be consumed from other cloud providers or also from other corporate customers or even our competitors. And it looks like potentially the cloud services gateway might be a good candidate for exposing those APIs from the cloud. So let's take a look at our API marketplace. If you visit, for example, market.enco.io, you will find all the typical APIs that a telco would expose. Okay? Not so exciting to have a send SMS API, I know. However, due to our innovation department, we also have other kinds of APIs that we expose here. For example, we have a blockchain as a service API, right? We have a real-time crowd management API. But what are these APIs? I'll tell you what. Let's take a look at the real-time crowd management API just to give you an indication of the kind of things that we can do as a telco and the kind of capabilities that we offer to our customers. Imagine for a moment that the London Transport Authority 
had the capability of knowing at any given time how many people are waiting at any bus stop in London. And based upon that insight and knowledge, they could perform real-time routing of their buses to take care of that need. Okay? I'll give you an example. With this API, you can define geographical zones. Okay? For any one of those zones, you can then create a stream to receive real-time anonymized data of the actual number of uh, local and international GSMs within that block. Okay? Here's an example of what that would look like. Imagine each of these bins, as they're called, are a bus stop in London. You can see for the first bin, there are 314 people with national numbers waiting at that bus stop right now. You don't know who they are, but you know they're there, and you know there's something you can do about that because you have this information. Conversely, you can see there are 103 people waiting at this bus stop. Is that important? Well, I think yes, but maybe it's more important to take care of the people in the first bus stop than below. But it's up to you, as the user of the API, to make that determination. But how can you make that determination? Well, imagine for a moment that you use that information to create a layer on top of a map. Now, based upon your own parameters, you could say, OK, anything above 100 people waiting at a given bus stop, we will color orange. Anything over 200 people waiting at a bus stop, we could color red. Now, all of a sudden, you can visually see how many people are waiting at any given bus stop, and then you can reroute your buses accordingly. OK? Pretty cool, I think. So that's one example of, uh, of an API that we're exposing. Um, I have two and a half minutes, so maybe I'll show you another one, show you another API. How about we look at the blockchain as a service API? Here you have the ability to create a private or public blockchain that you have complete control over. Done for you, managed for you, all the operational aspects. All you have to do is invoke a few APIs. Done. Here you can manage wallets. You can create and manage smart contracts to do whatever you see fit. You can manage the transactions that happen over that blockchain. And what's really cool is that you can even apply logic on that blockchain by integrating with the cloud engine. So imagine for a moment that you create via drag and drop on the cloud engine a piece of logic that says something like, uh, anytime a new wallet is created, I want the send SMS API to be invoked to notify me of that new wallet creation. Perfectly possible. It's quite a powerful um, API that we offer. You can see here, based upon uh, this screenshot here, you can manage wallets, you can export them, you can transfer them, you can manage your smart contracts, um, you can manage your transactions as well. There's really a lot you can do there. But all in all, what we're trying to say is that you know, we're focusing on delighting our customers and delivering value and doing it at a lower cost. So we use WSO2 to do what it does best, and we let it do that. For us, WSO2 is an API management platform. It handles APIs. It manages them. So we don't have to focus on that. We focus on our business because that's what we're supposed to be doing anyway, right? We're not supposed to be focusing on the technology underlying it and managing it. We let WSO2 do that, and it's working great for us to date. So that's the presentation for today. I wanted to uh, give you a good overview of what we're doing. Um, I hope it was of interest to you. And I think, yeah, why not? Let's take some time for some questions. Yes, um, maybe we'll get a microphone. How long have you been working with the solution then? How long have we been? Working with w w the solution. 
with the solution. Yeah. The solution being WSO2. Yes. Uh, many years. Um, I think Bart maybe over there in the middle can, can answer that. What are we saying? Four years? Four years. Yes. If you want, if, if I have your permission, that is, I would like to show you another use case of the RTCM uh, API, because I think it's, it's quite cool. Is, is that OK? It'll take maybe one minute. Yeah? OK. I hope it's here now. I'll just run through the slides. I have some backup slides there. OK, so we showed the, uh, the use case of um, managing bus stops. But this concept can be extended much further. Imagine for a moment you're an advertiser, like, and you, you manage the billboards, the digital billboards in London. In this particular case, you can see there's a billboard above McDonald's, and across the road, you have a cinema. And here they're showing Aladdin. Well, at any given time, you know what time of the day it is, right? So you already have a good indication of the schedule of the cinema across the road. If, this, if the people owning this billboard were to use the real-time crowd management API, they would also know how many people are waiting on front of the cinema at any given time of the day, right? Now, imagine that Aladdin is going to start in half an hour. There are 300 people waiting outside the cinema. And here's a billboard sitting there with a McDonald's underneath. I think if I were the owner of that billboard, I would display a completely customized advert to these people saying, hey, guys, we know you're waiting for Aladdin, but you know what? It doesn't start for another half hour. Drop into McDonald's, we'll give you a 10% discount, and you'll have eaten your burger, and you'll be back in the queue by the time the film starts, right? Why not? It's perfectly possible. So that's, that's pretty cool. And I'll, I'll finish with a funny one. I, I promise this is the last one. Imagine you're the queen. Even the queen could use this API, right? Imagine she's sitting on her throne, you know, wondering what to do. Oh, I got some engagements. And she's thinking, you know, how many people are waiting for me outside to just give a wave? Using the RTCM API, she could see, ah, you know, I have 2,000 less people outside my gates today than I did yesterday. Maybe I'll go up to the window and give them a wave, you know? So there, there are lots of possibilities here. And really, the only limitation is your imagination. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I would, advise, I, I, would, I would invite you to take a look at market.enco.io to take a look at these two APIs and the other ones that we have exposed there, because uh, I think they're pretty cool. OK, thank you, guys.